Uh, so, uh, welcome back to the keynote lecture by Professor Charles Mansky uh, on policy responses to the COVID pandemic. Uh, also, uh, thanks very much for uh, Chuck for uh, 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 taking time to do this lecture. And uh, let's first welcome Professor Yin Yao Hu from Johns Hopkins University to give us an introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Ying Yao Hu from Johns Hopkins. Uh, I'm also um, the coordinator of the Center for Econometrics and Micro Data Practice of Jinan University. So before I introduce Chuck, uh, let me say a few words about the center. Uh, so our center uh, actually uh, focus on microeconometrics and we um, intend to introduce state of arts quantitative methodologies to apply micro research in China. Uh, so for now we have uh, seven uh, local faculty members and it will increase to nine in the fall. And uh, uh, we probably have uh, 26 international fellows outside China. Uh, they actually interact with our local faculty members and other researchers in China every year through the center. And we uh, offer uh, uh, research conferences, workshops, and training courses. So one thing I want to mention actually is, uh, so we will, uh, on August 10th to 14th, we will organize a virtual uh, econometrics camp on panel data econometrics and its applications. Uh, we invited uh, three uh, instructors, uh, Manuel uh, uh, Arilano, uh, Stefan Bohom, and uh, Aureo Dipola will uh, give lectures in, in that week. So um, uh, we're inviting uh, researchers and also graduate students to um, participate. So uh, today um, uh, we're very happy to have Pro Professor Chuck Mansky here. Um, uh, he actually doesn't really need a very um, long introduction. Uh, he's a Board of Trustees Professor uh, of Economics at Northwestern University, uh, members of uh, National, National Academy of Science and Fellows of uh, uh, American Acad Acad Academy of Arts and Science uh, and the Econometric Society. Um, so he has done substantial work uh, in the areas of decision-making public policy analysis, uh, especially under uncertainty, uh, he made many fundamental contributions in kinematrics, uh, uh, including uh, partial identification, identification of discrete choice models, and identification of in social interactions. Uh, Chuck has also written extensively to a broader audience beyond the kinematics, um, including um, healthcare and, of course, uh, the recent uh, COVID 19 pandemic. Um, Personally, I would not be surprised when Chuck gets the Nobel Prize someday. Uh, so now let's uh, welcome Professor Chuck, Chuck Mansky. Should I go to share screen? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, okay, sure. Okay, are you seeing my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Happy to uh, be here. I'm sitting in Chicago right now. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, various uncertainties associated uh, with the uh, pandemic. Uh, I'm sure everybody is aware uh, that there is an enormous set of uncertainties about the nature of the disease, the dynamics of the pandemic, and uh, behavioral responses, the effect on the macroeconomy, and on and on and on. And um, so by now, I think people have become uh, very um, uh, aware uh, in a qualitative sense of these uncertainties. Um, people talk about how little is known. Um, but I'm quite troubled that even though there's a uh, very strong qualitative sense of the uncertainties, it, it's been very hard to characterize them quantitatively uh, to measure the uncertainties. And uh, I think we really need to um, measure these uncertainties if we're going to make good 
decisions. And the good decisions would be both at the clinical level for uh, doctors treating patients and at the macro level for public policy. So if you see the slide, you see that I actually, I, I put two words in bold here. I don't, it's not enough to measure the uncertainties. It has to be credible measurement of the uncertainties uh, that, you know, you really believe what's being uh, said. Um, and I also uh, talk about making reasonable uh, decisions. And I, that's very uh, intentional because I think it's much too much to hope to think that we can make optimal decisions. Economists love to think about uh, making optimal decisions, but that's really asking too much. So what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, my research on several of the uncertainties uh, that are relevant to decision making. Now, to begin, I want to give some background for those of you who don't know uh, uh, what I've been doing uh, uh, that's relevant to this. And um, for, you know, of course, I'm an econometrician, so I study uh, methodology for empirical research. For the past 10 years, I've increasingly been doing uh, research on patient care under uncertainty, really uh, medical applications rather than economic applications of econometrics. And uh, so I want to give a little bit of background on that because you'll see how it uh, flows directly into the code. So just the word uncertainty. Usually when we think about uncertainty, we think about making probabilistic predictions. Um, the issue is though that very often we don't have enough information to really make precise probabilistic predictions. Let me give an example. In a medical context, uh, a very common thing, a patient may ask uh, his or her doctor, what's the chance that will develop some disease in the next five years? And the patient would like to get an answer like, well, it's 20% or it's 80% or it's 70%. But that may be asking too much. If you actually think about what's known in the medical literature, you may not be able to give a precise answer. Maybe the clinician could give a range like 20 to 40%. So they put a bound on it. And that may be more credible than giving an exact probability. Now, uh, I have to have a disclaimer first, uh, since I'm going to be talking about medical research. I have no formal training in medicine at all. I, in high school, I did not even have a biology course. I, I've never had a course in anything remotely like medicine. So how, how can I talk about this at all? It's because uh, even though uh, I, and probably most of you as economists, don't have background in medical research, um, I think many of us are well equipped to talk about the methodology of empirical research, what's called evidence-based medicine in that literature, because this really does lie within the expertise of econometricians and statisticians. Because if you abstract from the medical applications and think about what's actually going on in medical research on treatment response, medical re research on risk assessment, like what's the chance I will get a disease and so on, the, there is this common objective that you want to do probabilistic prediction of uh, outcomes conditional on observed uh, covariance. Here I talk about uh, patient outcomes conditioning on observed patient uh, covariance. Now, what, what's probabilistic prediction conditioning on covariance? This is what we do in econometrics all the time. This is what uh, I, I, I routinely uh, just call it regression. You want to regress y on x. You want to learn the distribution of an outcome uh, conditional on uh, covariance. Um, so I typically I would just call this regression. If I were talking with computer scientists, I might have to call it machine learning or artificial intelligence. You can use whatever name you want, but whatever it is, we, we know exactly what this is. Okay, so where does econometrics come in? Because of course there are inferential difficulties and for a long time, for a hundred years, We've made a distinction between two very different inferential problems. One is statistical imprecision, and the other is identification problems. And everyone knows that uh, the distinction between the two is that statistical theory characterizes the inferences that can be drawn about a population by observing a sample with uh, well understood characteristics, like a random sample. Identification analysis takes sample size to infinity and asks what are the inferential problems that persist when sample size grows without bound. And of course, econometrics has always distinguished itself from st statistics by being very much interested in identification problems. I give a couple of references here from my own work, because of course, it's, it's, you know, uh, j just to give one thing for those of you who want to wear you know, this literature. So I have a book on identification for prediction and decision. It's what I used to teach first year PhD econometrics. 
And uh, so that's a place to start from my perspective. Um, so even though I'm mostly focused on identification problems, it's not entirely that. I also uh, do, of course, work on statistical imprecision, but I don't do it in a standard way. What I've been for almost 20 years been doing is applying statistical decision theory uh, as my way of dealing with finite sample problems. So I give one reference here to uh, what was my initial big paper in Econometrica back in 2004. Now, uh, this is going to give a few examples of identification problems, probably uh, fully uh, recognized by most of you who are listening. Uh, analysis of treatment response. We have a problem of unobservability of counterfactual treatment outcomes. You can observe what happens to someone for the treatment they receive. You don't observe what would have happened to them if they received a different uh, treatment. That creates an identification problem. There's no data collection that can overcome this. It's a logical uh, problem. So that's, uh, I think everyone recognizes that. Second one, uh, which I think essentially everybody recognizes, is what's sometimes called the problem of external validity, is you do a study on some group of people, some population, but you want to extrapolate it to a different group. So for example, in medicine, they'll do a randomized trial on some group of patients, but they're not the ones you really care about. You want to extrapolate the findings to a different population. So that's an identification problem. It's not a statistical inference problem. And then there are kind of more ordinary problems of imperfect data quality, but they're very important, of uh, just missing data and measurement errors and, and so on. So these are all identification problems. Now, in terms of my own research, uh, uh, for about uh, uh, 30 years now, uh, I've been pushing very hard on the idea that uh, if you may not be able to get what we now call point identification, that you may not have enough incredible information to pin some, something down fully. And then instead, uh, you may have to suffice with what we call partial identification. And partial identification removes the traditional focus of econometrics on point estimates that are obtained under strong assumptions. We make weaker assumptions, uh, putting a lot of um, emphasis on the credibility of the assumptions that we make. Um, because we want the results to be believable. And when you do that, you typically don't get point estimates, you get bounds. Okay, so it's become, you know, it's what I do every day is to report bounds on quantities rather than uh, point estimates. Now, why do you do this? Um, I, I want, you know, of course, I do econometric theory, but I really want this to be useful for, to inform decision making. So I really, you know, care deeply about the implications of all these both the identification problems and statistical imprecision for decision making. And we'll see that in what I talk about explicitly in just a few minutes about COVID. So um, you can take this kind of general problem about choosing between treatment A and B, and you don't know which one's better. And the thing to keep in mind always is that there is no optimal way to choose. If you don't know which one's better, there is no optimal way. There may be reasonable ways, though. And so I can flesh that out in the COVID context uh, in just a bit. Okay, just finally on this background, um, uh, I've written lots of stuff about this in the medical uh, public health context over the past 10 years. And of course, I, I, I have to give a plug for my book on uh, patient care under uncertainty, which Princeton University Press published uh, back last fall. And this is a book that's verbal. It's not a technical book. I was trying to reach out to a broader audience. And it, of course, refers to all the technical articles that. Uh, that are underneath. Okay, so if we go back to uh, a few months ago, it was such a different world. Uh, I actually just uh, when the uh, I wasn't in China, but I was in uh, uh, I was in London and then in the Scotland in the beginning of March when all hell broke loose. And uh, my wife and I had our own venture of trying to get back to the United States in the middle of March when uh, the government put down travel restrictions and so on. And we came back in the middle of March and been under lockdown for most of that time since then. Um, they, as I think you know, most of you have, I'm sure wherever you are in the world have uh, suffered from this too. There is one good thing about being under lockdown is that with no travel and no other distractions, you get a lot of time to do research. So over the past, since the middle of March, uh, I just, I put other things aside and, uh, you know, I've been doing all this work on uh, patient care under uncertainty and so much of it seemed applicable to uh, COVID. So I just started writing and I still am, this is still continuing, um, 
uh, various kinds of things uh, that are related to the uh, pandemic. So I'm going to talk about four pieces of work uh, that are complete, and the uh, titles are up on uh, here. Uh, two of them are already published, as you see here. The other, the, the two bottom ones are out in uh, NBER working papers, and uh, they're also all available on my uh, webpage uh, if you go underneath. So what I'm going to do now, and the rest of the time, is um, go through and just summarize um, the main points in each of these papers, and then make a, some concluding remarks. And of course, you can go back and read the uh, actual papers to get the details. Okay, first of all, uh, first piece, which uh, Francesco Molinari and I spent, we just worked flat out for several weeks uh, to a month in uh, late March and uh, early April to get this paper done. And then uh, through a very uh, fortunate circumstance, it was actually, it's the fastest publication I've ever had in my life because uh, the Journal of Econometrics started a uh, uh, COVID metrics uh, initiative and very quickly uh, um, submitted a paper and got reviewed and it's actually available online at the journal now. So let me talk about this. It's about a uh, problem that I'm, uh, I'm sure everyone's aware of. It's just the basic data problem that it's been difficult to know what fraction of the population have actually been infected. And um, the, the reason why there, 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 there's one large reason that's well appreciated and another reason that's also important but less well appreciated why it's been difficult to know what the infection rate has been. The, the reason that I think everyone's aware of is that testing, uh, you, you diagnose someone and confirm a case through testing, but uh, testing has been very limited. So uh, basically in the United States, you know, it depends on exactly where you are, maybe 1%, maybe one and a half to at most 2% of different local populations have been tested. So if you think about a, uh, this is a general uh, missing data problem, we may have 98%, 99% of the data missing. If that's the case, then if you make no assumptions at all, then you get, you try to do ordinary partial identification analysis, you get extraordinarily wide bounds and you really can't you know, learn much of anything. Um, so the question is, what can you usefully say that's credible because of the missing data problem, uh, because uh, testing has been so limited? Um, and the particular problem about testing, of course, is that it's uh, not been random. If, if a testing were random, there'd be no issue. Uh, there'd be a finite sample problem, but there'd be no, no identification problem. But actually, uh, there's been a very highly uh, selective testing in almost every location that I know, so that uh, the, uh, people who have been tested tend to be ones who, um, you know, much more chance of being infected than the ones who uh, were not tested, because you have to show symptoms and so on to be tested. Okay, so that problem I think is well appreciated. The question is to characterize it quantitatively, what the implications are. The second problem that's uh, less well appreciated is that the tests themselves are imperfect. This is a measurement error problem, is that if you do the nasal swab test for infection, then uh, they're not always accurate. Uh, they're much more accurate in one direction than in another direction. The so-called rate of false positives is very low, but the what's called the rate of false negatives is actually quite substantial. And it's not exactly clear what it is. So you have this measurement problem that's uh, overlaid on the missing data problem. And uh, if you put the two together, you do get a general conclusion that reported rates of infection are lower than actual rates, which also means the reported rates of severe illness and also death rates are actually higher than actual rates. The reason for that is, of course, is that if I don't, the uh, if I want to get the rate of uh, death, that's going to among those who are infected. That's the number of deaths divided by the number of infected. So the number of infected is in the denominator, and if you don't know the denominator, then you don't know the ratio. So, um, so these have been uh, severe data problems. Now. Lots of people have been aware of these data problems. The question is what you do about it. Uh, lots of point estimates have, uh, have been put out by uh, different groups of researchers. The estimates differ in the assumptions that they use because we all have the same data, which is pretty weak. So they combine the data with different assumptions. They get from different results. Uh, but the, none of these assumptions or estimates has been thought credible enough to get consensus. So, so the estimates have been all over the place. Now, when I come into this, when I mean I, I mean I together with Francesca, because we all did this all together. Uh, I think it's misguided to look at any one of these point estimates under strong assumptions. We think it's much more uh, informative to determine the range of infection rates and range of severe illness implied by a credible spectrum of assumptions. So this is the classic problem of partial identification. So what we do is we 
uh, combined available data with credible assumptions to bound the infection rate in particular places and particular dates because it changes over time and over where you are. Uh, we go through the logic, you know, it's a technical paper on the nature of the identification problem, and then we report illustrative bounds. Now, uh, this is all I'm going to say about this because you got to dig into the paper and read it. Um, but let me say, in terms of the assumptions, the, the key assumption that we make is a monotonicity assumption, which we think is highly credible in the current context, which is that the uh, infection rate among people who've been tested is higher than the infection rate among people who have not been tested. Okay, I read it the opposite way here, that the infection rate among the untested is lower than the rate among uh, the tested. Because in order to be tested, you have to show symptoms or have had contact with someone who's known to be infected. So that's a monotonicity assumption. It provides some identifying power. We also assume a bound on the accuracy of nasal, nasal swab tests. Uh, and we really try to read the medical literature on this to see what's known. Uh, and they, they don't precisely know, so we just put a bound on that. We have a few other assumptions. We derive a bound on the population effective rate. So at the, on the bottom of the slide, this is just some illustrative findings, the kind of, we have long tables with many more findings of this. We focused the concreteness on three places, on Illinois, because I'm in Chicago, uh, on in New York, because Francesca is at Cornell in New York, and on Italy, because she, Francesca is Italian, and also Italian, Italy, you know, had a real bad, uh, bad problem with the virus, so we thought that was interesting. So these are the kind of results that uh, we present, uh, which are bounds, first on the infection rate, and you see the bounds on the slide. Uh, they're, they're wide, but they're still informative. So if you take like that bound for New York, which is in the middle, on April 24th, it's between 0 0.017 and 0 0.618, okay? Well, that's, that's a fairly wide bound. But actually, but it's not between zero and one. If we made no assumptions at all, we would just be between zero and one, basically. So we actually uh, have to make assumptions even to get it this far down. Now, if you look at the point estimates in the literature, uh, they're all over the place. And they don't go, uh, uh, they, some of them are as low as 0.017. Uh, they don't go quite as high as 0.618, but you'll find people saying maybe it's 30%, 40% who've been infected in a place like New York. So that's what we get anyway. To do it for severe and for fatality, infection fatality ratios, you, you put those bounds in the denominator. If I go down to the bottom of the slide and you look for New York at the bound on the uh, 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 mortality rate, then uh, between 0, 0, 0.001 and 0, 0.049, okay? And that, so these are the kind of results that we report. Okay, now this is all that I'm gonna say about this because I wanna run through four different studies. <laughs> Excuse me. Flavor of the analysis. Okay, let me go on to the next one. This is a very simple matter, but very important. I, I was talking a uh, just a, a bit about go about the uh, uh, imperfect accuracy of the test. Now, as I think we all know by now, there are two classes of tests. There are the nasal swab test, testing for infection, and then there are the an antibody tests, which are blood tests for which you test whether someone's been infected in the past, not whether they have a current infection, but whether they are infected in the past so that the body has built up uh, antibodies. Now, if you read the, uh, I'm sure we're all interested in this personally because we want to know have we been infected by COVID or, you know, do we have antibodies and so on. So you may be reading this, uh, these things out of personal interest as well as professional interest. Um, there are measures of accuracy that are reported in research articles and in the media. And you have to be very careful about what they are. Okay, so here, this is a basic point in epidemiology. This is understood fully by every epidemiologist, but it is not understood by the general public and there's been a lot of misperception. What you should really want to care about is what I write here is what's called the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. These are terms from epidemiology. Positive predictive value means take someone who's been tested and you find out they get a positive test result. So it indicates there was uh, illness. We say, well, given that pause, conditional on that positive test result, what's the chance that this person did have COVID or does have it uh, presently? So, if I, so it's probability of Y given X. X is the test result and Y is do you have the illness? That's what you care about. So this is probability of Y equals one given X equals one. Negative predictive value is the same thing, but conditioning on a negative result, what's the chance that you don't have it? That's probability of y equals zero given x equals zero. These are the things that we really care about. 
it's rare in the uh, literature in epidemiology to see reports of positive or negative predictive values. What you see all the time instead is reports of something called sensitivity and specificity. And it's as easy as to explain mathematically. I said what you care about is the probability of Y given X, the probability of illness conditional on the test result, what's reported in the medical literature almost all the time is the opposite conditional probability is the probability of X given Y. So sensitivity is the chance that an effective pers person receives a positive test result. So that's probability of X equals one given Y equals one. Specificity is the other way. It's the probability of X equals zero given Y equals zero. So now if you ask, well, why do I care about this? And the answer is you don't. Because in the real world, you don't know whether someone's infected or not infected. You don't, we don't want to predict their test result given knowledge of the infection. We want to do it the other way. We, we have the test result and we want to predict uh, the, uh, whether they're ill ra rather than predicting the test result given uh, knowledge of illness. So this seems a little bit nuts, actually. And uh, so the question is, uh, why is this done? It turns out if you read the epidemiology literature that they find it easier to measure uh, P of X given Y than P of Y given X. Now, anyone who's had the most basic probability and statistics course knows that you can relate P of Y given X and P of X given Y via Bayes' theorem. And so you can get from specificity and sensitivity to the things that we really care about if you know the marginal probability of illness, which is P of Y equals one. That's called the prevalence in the literature. But what is P of Y equals one? That's the overall infection rate in the population. And that's what I just said based on my work with Francesca, we just don't know the overall infection rate. The bounds for New York were between like, uh, you know, 1% and 61% uh, or something like that. So we can't use Bayes' theorem to get from sensitivity and specificity to the things we really care about, which is PPV and uh, NPV. So, what goes on in the epidemiology literature is they'll, they'll make an assumption. We'll, we'll assume that the fraction infected is 0.05 or 0.01 or whatever it is, and then they'll use base there and they'll do the calculations. But there's no credibility for that. So what I do in this small paper, this is a very short 10 page paper, is to say, look, uh, we don't really know what the prevalence is. So let's put a bound on the prevalence and derive, use then use sensitivity and specificity to derive a bound on uh, positive, and predictive, uh, positive and negative predictive values. I, I do it for empirically, <coughs> I do it particularly for the antibody tests uh, that have been authorized by the uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. And, uh, and I get results and here they are. This, this is my last slide on this. Uh, this is the twelve tests. You can go to the FDA website and get the document from which I took this. The FDA gave uh, a kind of emergency approval to tell twelve different uh, antibody tests. Uh, this is the particular one of the twelve. Um, and uh, so, if you look up here, I think if you can see this where I, with my mouse, uh, the, the FDA will tell you what sensitivity is as 0.88. It'll tell you what specificity is as 0.98. They got this information from the company that uh, developed the test. Now, then the F, but they said they, the FDA is not stupid. They know what you really care about is positive predictive value and negative predictive value, but they don't know what prevalence is. So they assume that the prevalence and the infected rate is 0.05, and then they give you point estimates of, of uh, positive and negative predictive rates of 0.794 and 0.994. Now I look at this and say, well, I don't, you know, where did this 0.05 come from? The FDA has no reason to assume that. Let's instead put a bound on prevalence. So if you come down here on the slide, this is the bound using the New York data, 0.017 to 0.618, and then use that through base theorem to derive a bound on positive predictive value. And it's a fairly wide bound between 0.559 and 0.992. Do the same thing for negative predictive value. And you get a bound there, it's 0.836 to 0.998. Now this, at, at first this may, so this bound is actually pretty narrow. And this for negative predictive value, but for positive predictive value, it's pretty wide. Well, why does that happen? That it's very easy to see through the algebra based theorem. And I discussed this in the paper. It depends on exactly what you know in terms of your bounds on prevalence and the way based theorem um, uh, plays out that the implications for inference on PPV and NPV are very asymmetric. So that you can actually learn much more about NPV than you can about PPV.
So that's what this paper does, okay? And I'd love to talk about it more, but I've got two more things to talk about. I want to leave time for uh, discussion. So that's all I'm going to say about that. And again, you can go to my webpage or to the MBER working uh, paper page and uh, find uh, this paper. Okay, now something that's brand new, uh, paper with uh, Alex Tetanoff that I'm uh, actually, uh, uh, I, I think is, uh, Alex and I think is really very important. Um, and comes to uh, the problem of uh, decision making rather than uh, data uh, assessment per se on uh, statistical pro decision properties of imprecise trials assessed in COVID-19 drugs. Uh, this is on my webpage right now. It will be out as an MBER working paper this coming Monday. Uh, it's also available on Archive and MedArchive if you uh, want it there. So let me, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on this. Um, so I think everyone's aware that there's been a very, a, a rush of randomized trials trying to um, evaluate uh, treatments uh, for COVID, particularly in the severe cases of patients who are hospitalized. And if you've been reading about these randomized trials, there's a kind of um, a common theme to them that they, they take one thing that they call standard care. Now, what is standard care for COVID? It's not all that precise because this is a brand new disease. It's not as if we've been treating this for a hundred years, but standard care basically means if someone goes to the hospital and you try to keep them uh, comfortable and then if they need uh, assistance with breathing you give them oxygen and then in the worst cases maybe a ventilator you know if it's very very bad and that's about it for standard care because there's no uh, standard drug treatment uh, but there are all kinds of drugs that have been uh, proposed and so what they want to do is compare so-called standard care with uh, experimental drugs the samples uh, typically have a uh, small size. Uh, in the early stages, particularly in the uh, trials, there were many trials done in China early on because of course the pandemic was first in China. So it was natural to have data in China first. And often the, uh, the sample sizes, like you know, uh, you know, to each treatment, like 50 people in each treatment or 100 people in each treatment. Now there is beginning to be much larger trials with thousands of people, but there's still many, many uh, small trials. So you have, so you have an ordinary problem of statistical imprecision. Not forget about identification problems. Just think about statistical imprecision. Now put yourself in the position of a doctor, a clinician who reads uh, medical articles about the results of the trials uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet or the British Medical Journal and all the, the major medical journals. And they're trying to figure out what should they do? Um, how, how should they assess the results of these trials? So I think if you read the medical literature, <clears throat> you quickly find that the medical, medical research is a true believer in uh, hypothesis testing in classical hypothesis testing. And this has gone on for, I don't know, since the 1930s or 40s. Uh, this is really totally textbook uh, hypothesis testing. You make a null hypothesis that the new, uh, the innovation, the new experimental drug is no better than standard care. And then you choose the uh, innovation only, it's not enough that the estimated treatment effect is positive, but it also has to be statistically significant, okay? So as anybody who knows about hypothesis testing knows, this very much biases things towards standard care, towards the null hypothesis. You have to overturn the null hypothesis. And uh, this is the standard way that, that medical research is done uh, for a long, long time. Now, um, Alex and I uh, do not think that it should be done that way. And in fact, I've been uh, writing on this since the early 2000s, and Alex and I have jointly written several papers on this uh, since then. Um, instead, we think we should evaluate um, randomized trials from the perspective of near optimality, which jointly considers the probability and magnitude of decision errors. Near optimality <clears throat> is a simple term we use. It's actually uh, formally, it's maximum regret. So I do minimax regret analysis for technical articles that talk about maximum regret. But uh, for more general audiences, I think the near term near optimality uh, is, uh, uh, it sounds better. It means uh, you know, uniformly across all possible states of nature, how close to making optimal decisions can you get? Now, when you take uh, that near optimality or maximum regret perspective, 
then um, it turns out that instead of hypothesis testing, a very appealing uh, criterion for uh, decision making is the empirical success rule. And the empirical success rule is it just says ignore statistical significance and just look at which, what does better in the trial. So if one treatment does better than the other treatment in the trial, we'll go with the treatment that does better. So which one works better in empirical success? Not paying attention to statistical significance. So what we do in this new paper is we apply these ideas, which have been around, I say, since the early uh, 2000s in my own work and work of various other econometricians. Uh, first, a study of two arm trials. And then, uh, to, uh, and then what's really new in the paper is to extend them to multi-arm trials. So I'm going to give a simple example of a two-arm trial in a moment, a Chinese trial that received a lot of attention. For multi-arm trials, I'll just mention now, there's a very large trial going on in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom, called a recovery trial that compares standard care with four different uh, experimental drugs. So the new methodological work in our paper is computational work on how to apply new optimality to that case. And the bottom line is that the empirical success rule yields treatment results that are much closer to optimal than those generated by criteria based on hypothesis. Okay, so that's the bottom line. Let me just give an example uh, from this Chinese trial, which received a lot of attention because I think it's very instructive. Uh, this is Cow et al. It's published quite recently in the New England Journal of Medicine um, it, formally, it was available as a, a med archive and you know, elsewhere or whatever. We, we, we saw it a while ago, but uh, it, it, uh, it, this, this is a two-arm trial. It compares standard care with a particular set of drugs, a pair of drugs called Lopinavir and Ritonavir. Who knows who makes up these names? There's about 100 people receiving standard care. It's actually 99 receiving, uh, 100 receiving standard care, 99 receiving standard care plus the new drug. Okay, so a main thing they measure, they measure clinical improvement for patients who live, and then they measure mortality for those who die, mortality within 28 days. Now, if you look at the raw data, the innovation, you know, giving the experimental drug actually does better than standard care along both outcomes, both clinical improvement and mortality. Let me just uh, tell you what the results were for mortality. Basically, it's 100, it's balanced, 100 in each treatment group. And receiving 20, in standard care, 25 people died out of 100, because these are patients with severe illness. 25 out of 100 died. With the innovation, 19 out of 100 died. And I said, well, 19 out of 100 versus 25 out of 100, uh, that's not as definitive as you would like, but that's evidence uh, to me that's in favor of the new drug. That's not what the, they reported in the, in the article. If you go read the New England Journal of Medicine article, this is a quote they reported in hospitalized adult patients with severe COVID-19. No benefit was observed with uh, the drug treatment beyond standard care. So what do they mean by no benefit? It's just not true. What they meant was there was no statistically significant benefit. And then the way they wrote it is they eliminated the statistical significance and acted as if there was no benefit. Now, I don't raise this to um, criticize this particular study. This is the standard way of reporting in the entire medical literature. So you have to be very careful. And Alex and I think that's just not right. And that actually, if I'm a doctor, you should take this at least as modest evidence in favor of the uh, new drugs rather than standard care. Now, I'm going to skip some slides because I just don't have time. I was going to, if I had time, I would go into more detail about trying to define near optimality, maximum regret, and exactly what it means, but you can just uh, go read it in the uh, paper. And I'll just want to uh, conclude on this because I have one, uh, one more topic I want to talk about. Uh, the, the underlying thing, problem in the medical literature is that it's always shown deference to standard care through hypothesis testing. And I think many of you are aware, that it's, it's, uh, when I say that I've been critical hypothesis testing, that's true, I've, uh, and Alex, we're, we're critical, but it's not just us. There's, uh, there's an enormous amount of criticism of hypothesis testing and associated use of p-values that's been building over the past 20 years. And many of you may know the American Statistical Association had a whole committee that's looked into this and has uh, moved very far away from hypothesis testing uh, over the past five years. Uh, so, um, so so what I'm talking about is part of that. The particular thing that Alex and I bring to this is you're gonna to have to replace hypothesis testing by something. And what we think is it should be replaced by a statistical decision theory, which was developed by Abraham Walden way, way back in the 1940s. 
From the perspective of near optimality of maximum regret, the empirical success rule does very well. And uh, it doesn't have this deference to standard care. And we think that's the way things should be done. So we, we actually will stick our necks out and think this is actually very important for how uh, doctors actually make decisions. Okay. Uh, so as I said, I'm quite excited about this work. Uh, I wish I had more time to talk about it, but uh, I'm going to go on because I got one more topic, uh, which uh, I think is also extremely important. Uh, this was not published uh, so far as a technical paper. I published a commentary very early on. It's the very first thing I wrote. It uh, is a kind of a blog uh, published online by Scientific American back in late March. Um, the, uh, the reason was that uh, the epidemiologists were, were doing modeling and making very uh, sharp forecasts of uh, what's going to happen in the pandemic. And I know enough, I, I've read epidemiological modeling over, over the years because I've been doing medical research. I particularly published a couple of papers on vaccination policy. So I had to read the epidemiology literature. And uh, I, you know, I had formed some impressions of it. And so there were two main points I made. I wrote this for a general audience in Scientific American. I made two big points. One is that the epidemiological literature is much too narrow. If you look at the epidemiological literature, what they forecast they're only concerned with health impacts. Now, health impacts of policy are obviously important, but particularly with a pandemic of COVID, health impacts are not the only thing that matters. We, we also care about uh, severe economic impacts of having uh, lockdowns of society and everyone losing jobs. We care about uh, mental health impacts and uh, on and on and on, you know, on inequality and so on. And there's none of that in the epidemiological literature. They only, the, for, epidemiology is a very interesting, strong literature from a um, scientific perspective, but it's a very narrow literature. It focuses only on health. And I think the reason for that is the background of the researchers. The researchers who do epidemiology are trained in medicine and public health. They're not trained in social sciences or economics. So that's one big problem. Second big problem is that even if you just look at what they do, uh, within, you know, just forecasting, let's say, death rates and infection rates and so on, there's very little basis to assess the real, uh, realism of the models that have been developed. Epidemiologic, I think economists now have become very aware uh, of the uh, SIR models, the, you know, the disease transmission models. Uh, economists know about the very earliest ones from the 1920s, but, but there's 100 years close to 100 years of very sophisticated development of these mathematical models of disease spread. Um, the problem is, though, is that it's like other modeling, uh, and particularly it's very much like dynamic macroeconomic modeling, is that it's very hard to assess the credibility of these models. You can go see the math and do forecasts, but you don't know whether the model is realistic. Now, this is extremely important to me. I've been arguing for a long time that is vital to communicate uncertainty and research of all kinds of public policy. I give one uh, reference here, article I have in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on communicating uncertainty and policy analysis. That summarizes work I've done over the past uh, decade or so. Uh, I really argue all the time for communicating uncertainty. I get very upset when uh, people do policy analysis with what I call incredible certitude. Incredible certitude means this, that you go to the research literature and people make these exact predictions. Like uh, if we do this policy, uh, 649,312 people will die. Something like that, you know, in, uh, across the world or whatever. Uh, they, they don't, they may, there may be some perfunctory confidence interval at most, but it really doesn't mean anything if you dig underneath. Expressions of uncertainty are rare. The truth is that the predictions are often fragile, resting on unsupported assumptions and limited data. And so the certitude is not credible. And this bothers me quite a bit. And it's a big problem in the epidemiology literature. Now, why is it so difficult to have credible results in the epidemiology literature? Uh, a, a, a large reason, you know, because I don't want to uh, criticize them too harshly, is their data is very limited. Epidemiology, like economics, relies mostly on, uh, uh, on observational data, not on randomized uh, trials. In particular, it's, epidemiology is very much like macroeconomics. Uh, 
you really can't do randomized trials at all. You have to use observational data. And we know that uh, interpretation of observational data is difficult. But if you're going to do that, so it's fine. I use observational data all the time in my own research. But when you do it, you have to face up to the uncertainties. And the problem is that they take the models too seriously. Now, I have to say here that this is a problem both in epidemiology and in macroeconomic models. Okay, and the reason I'm raised macro models is because I think many of you know that uh, macro economists have now been building um, mac new macro models that uh, add on some epidemiological component, an SIR model, uh, into their macro models. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about this. I have some slides talking particularly about the Imperial College London. Uh, uh, model, which has received a lot of attention. I don't, I don't we'll skip that for lack of time, uh, but this is a real clear cut case of incredible certitude. Uh, what I argue instead, just to finish on this, is I argue instead for something called adaptive uh, diversification. And uh, this goes back to technical work I did starting in uh, way back in 2009, article in the International Economic Review on Diversified Treatment Under Ambiguity. And this basically says, that look, if you've got uncertainty and we don't know, then forget the idea of getting optimal policy. We don't know enough to get optimal policy. So forget that idea, but, but you can still get a reasonable policy. And I think everybody knows that if you think about financial uh, investment, if you have uncertainty, we all know about diversification of the portfolio between safe and risky assets uh, as a way of dealing with uncertainty. You can do the same thing with uh, uh, public policy. So I started this in 2009. I write it on in great detail in a book in 2013 on public policy in an uncertain world. And I think this can be applied to COVID. I think what you can do with COVID is have different locations uh, and have different policies. Uh, in the United States, this is somewhat difficult. Because, I mean, we do have different policies because we have different states, uh, 50 states, and they can each have their own policy. Uh, I think this could be done quite more easily in China. Because in China, if you have a strong central government without 50 states, without federalism, then you could uh, purposefully try one policy in uh, one city and another policy in another. That would be diversification. And you could learn from that, like in a randomized experiment, and then you could update over time. Okay? So I really, you know, given particularly that this is virtual conferences nominally in China, I think this is particularly uh, applicable to places with strong central governments uh, to do this. I wish we had more time to talk about it. Uh, but I know I'm uh, running short. So I'm just going to uh, just skip this and because I want to leave a little bit of time for uh, discussion. Um, so I just got two more slides to finish up. If I think about this all together, uh, over the past few months, I said I'm working basically all the time on COVID related research. I've got a lot of other things that I, I'd like to do my, from now on over the summer as we continue because there's so many important questions. Uh, not just me, of course, um, uh, let me talk to econometricians and of course economists more generally. I think many of us have professional expertise that we can bring to bear and try to help out. And it's, it's very important that we do that. Uh, I, I know a number of other econometricians who've been working on COVID problems. There are lots of macroeconomists who, as I said, are doing macro modeling, joined with epidemiological modeling. Um, there's a lot that we can do to help out. We don't have backgrounds in medicine and epidemiology, but I want to emphasize again that from a methodological perspective, the kinds of modeling strategies, the kind of data issues, statistical issues, identification issues are ones that we're all familiar with. So we can help. So I see great scope for us to help. And it's also intellectually challenging work. It's publisher work, so that's great. The final thing I want to say, and then I'll uh, end, is that we've got to be careful. There's been a rush to report results. Uh, there's been a rush from the epidemiological modelers to report their results and then take them too seriously. And then governments make uh, policy decisions based on the results much too quickly. There's been a rush in reporting randomized trials and, or uh, uh, prospective studies. Some of them have to be retracted. This is very bad. I think we have to do this very uh, carefully um, and uh, avoid incredible certitude uh, because otherwise our results are not going to be trustworthy and uh, the governments and the public are not going to uh, pay attention to what we do. So, so I encourage you to do your own work. And this conference, is, of course, is an uh, example of that, that you have a whole set of papers on economists doing COVID research. And that's great. And I see much, much more to be done. OK, so I will 
Stop and I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, the talk uh, covers many important issues. Uh, we have the cutting edge economics and apply that to the COVID pandemic. And then we say how to obtain uh, more credible estimates on key parameters and uh, how the pandemic response can be improved. Uh, we really hope we could have more time to hear more. Uh, so right now we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if you have questions, you can click uh, raise a hand uh, in Zoom and I, uh, I will give the virtual mic to you to ask questions. Or you can type your questions in the Q&A window. <clears throat> And for those in panelists, you can directly unmute yourself if you have questions. So maybe I start with one question for Chuck. Uh, so I think uh, for the uh, fourth paper, the one on uh, policy diversification, uh, I think this is the one, is, the idea is very in, uh, in, uh, enlightening. And uh, so I think the idea starts from uh, like in financial assets. If we have a diversified portfolio, we can average out you know, individual risk. But in the case of pandemic, so if one, uh, if the policy uh, fails in one region, that could have uh, quite a large negative externality to other regions. So in this sense, uh, we might not be able to diversify too much of the risk away. So if one policy failure can have large negative consequences to other regions, then this diversification might be, the role might be limited. Yeah, and that's a very important point. Um, so one has to be careful about how one defines the regions. You're, you're, you're absolutely correct that the, uh, the formal analysis uh, that I've done on uh, tr uh, diversification, I've, I've done formal minimax regret analysis. Uh, dating back to the 2009 article. And the formal analysis assumes uh, no externalities, what we call individual treatment response. So that if I do something for one patient or one area, it doesn't affect what happens in another area. If you want to apply this uh, to a pandemic, with of course there can be transmission of disease across area, then uh, the, it has to be done in a, uh, the scale has to be uh, large enough that, um, that you don't have too much of a spillover, okay? Um, so for example, I'm not gonna, you wouldn't apply this uh, house by house or neighborhood by neighborhood, but I think you could uh, apply it uh, uh, city by city or region by region or uh, country by country, particularly today when there are restrictions on travel, okay? So the big problem, which I think you're uh, you correctly uh, raising is that uh, uh, travel would get in the way. So if things go bad in one place, then it will affect people somewhere else. But we do have restrictions on travel. Uh, airplane travel is now pretty difficult, you know, across countries. Uh, even when, if I go inside the United States, uh, you know, New York is really quite different from Arizona and um, there isn't that much travel going on. So I think a version of this actually uh, um, uh, could be applied uh, with the right uh, regional aggregation, but not at a very micro level, if more at a uh, uh, city or regional aggregation than a neighborhood or household ag uh, level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. Klaus? Klaus, I see you have a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Now, uh, Chuck, in the policy uh, discussion, uh, there is this idea that we should positively discriminate those people who are, so to speak, risk-free uh, because they had had the, uh, uh, the virus in some way, yes? Now, the question is, there's a lot of confusion about uh, what is the academic or the statistical basis for doing uh, such a thing. What, what would we need to do in, in, your, in your judgment? Uh, to go ahead with this idea. Yeah, uh, this is uh, based on um, antibody tests in particular, right? That uh, if you uh, test positive, then we'll declare that you're immune and you can go about your business. And so this is a, actually a big controversy right now. Um, um, so I wanna tell you, an article was published on this in the New England Journal of Medicine just yesterday, which was very interesting. 
uh, by uh, the lead author was Milton Weinstein at the uh, Harvard School of Public Health. And it's, it, it's not a research article, it's a commentary or op-ed. Uh, and it's very well worth reading because the uh, WHO took the view that uh, until we, the antibody tests are imperfect, okay? As I was saying before, I know they're imperfect, but I don't wanna say that they're uninformed, right? There is some information in the antibody tests, it's just that they're imperfect. The WHO was taking the view on that until we have a perfect antibody test, one, the person needs a perfect antibody test, and second, you have to know exactly how long the immunity uh, persists. Does it persist for six months or for three years or 10 years? That until we have that all down 100%, that we should not do anything of the policy that you were uh, just uh, mentioning. Uh, the article in the New England uh, Journal says that's crazy. It comes down very hard against the uh, WHO and says you're looking for a kind of scientific precision that's not attainable in the real world. And I like the article in the New England Journal yesterday because I've looked, this is a problem under uncertainty and we have to make decisions now. And you're looking for scientific purity that's too much to ask for. Now this goes back to the question about hypothesis testing that I was mentioning before because what the WHO does, the, the World Health Organization, has the, uh, the mindset of hypothesis testing. And it's standard care, you know, there's a null hypothesis that we don't know anything. And until you can uh, overturn the null hypothesis, you do nothing. That's the WHO uh, mentality. And um, what Weinstein and his co-authors were saying is that's not the way you, you do decisions under uncertainty. Um, and that's the way I view it. And, that, and that's the, the article I talked about by myself when uh, Alex Tepnoff takes very much the same view. We, we don't talk particularly about the policy you're raising, um, but I, I think on that case, uh, if, you know, I would, it's, it's a tough problem, but I might be willing to go ahead and do this at some level. And I, maybe I'd want to diversify it. Maybe I'd want some communities to allow people to go back to work based on antibody testing and others not. Um, and, and just deal with the uncertainty and uh, learn over time. Okay, thank you. Mm, any other questions? We have two minutes for probably one last question. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, this is Chen from Yale. Could you help me? Mm, yes. I, I can hear you. Is that Yale? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Really, yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Chen from Yale and Chuck. Chuck, it's yeah. so nice to hear this fantastic talk. Yeah, I was. Uh, going to follow up with the uh, yeah, class on this uh, New England paper, which was authored by my colleague, David Patel. And they oh, argue that okay. we are waiting for the uncertainty, as you mentioned, it just came out yeah. yesterday. And yeah. they ask, don't, don't let the idea to defeat the useful. So that's the uh, case word. So I think yeah. your paper is very uh, helpful to make a, a, a concrete policy regarding that. And I saw your paper, you have a, a narrower uh, range of uh, MQB, the negative predicted value. So right. should we act first on those MQB cases, since that's more precise. Um, that could be. I have not thought that through. I'm, I'm going. The paper I wrote on this, on the testing accuracy, right now it's a very short paper. I wanted to get something out quickly because this is basic confusion of sensitivity, expensive specificity and PPV, MPV. But I'm going back to, I'm, going, I'm in the middle of writing a longer version of that paper. And I, maybe I'll uh, be able to get into the, this, I hope to get into the decision-making uh, uh, implications of that when I do. Uh, yeah, so I think I, that's I, very I, important uh, because for nursing home, we really want to rule out those people have yeah. not been immune from any of this uh, uh, risk. Yeah. So if we know the negative, predictive values, and that's good enough to make and um, take actions now, instead yeah, of- that's right. Yeah, that's Is you want to know the PPV for some purposes, what, what, uh, what Klaus's uh, thing was, for, you really want to know PPV for what Klaus was talking about, but, mm -hmm. for, the, uh, but for other uh, policy questions, you want to know MPV. I'm interested to see the Yale Library in your background, uh, because I was yeah. supposed to come to Yale for a week in April, and one of the- yeah. uh, uh, casualties of the pandemic is my visit to Yale. Exactly, that was on my very, very calendar. But, uh, I'm very unfortunate. Yeah, <laughs> hope to we'll come back here soon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, uh, one last question in the Q and A uh, chat box. Uh, 
So the one is on how do you assess the uh, benefit of a meta analysis uh, on COVID? The benefit of of a meta meta studies. Oh boy, oh boy, meta analysis. Can I have another hour? Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the reason I say that is that I um, uh, in April is the first time I, I I have an article in an epidemiology journal. And uh, it's the journal whose name is just epidemiology, that's the name of the journal. And the title of the article is Towards Patient Center Meta Analysis. And it's a partial identification paper. And it is, uh, it begins, it is very, I'm very critical of traditional meta analysis. Uh, I, in my book, the 2019 book, I wrote a few pages on meta analysis. And then I, uh, and what I think is wrong. A meta analysis for those who you know it's combining with the pro I know we're going to run out of time, but for those of you who don't know what meta analysis is, you have many different studies and you want to combine the results across many different studies. And the question is, how do you do that? So the traditional way is what's called meta analysis is to take a weighted average of the results across the many different studies. And I think this is very wrong. Taking a weighted average of results across many studies is not the right thing to do because these studies are very different, different study populations, different treatments and so on. They totally ignore the identification problems. So I approach this from a partial identification perspective and I have this uh, article, it's in print uh, on uh, what I call patient-centered meta-analysis. Um, this issue will arise with COVID for sure as people trying to combine results across studies. Uh, and uh, I, I know we're well over time and you have to go on to another session, but um, I do have a lot to say about meta-analysis uh, if you want to take a look at that paper or I'll send you a reprint if you email me, okay? So I don't want to keep you too late, so we'll... Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thanks very much, Chuck, uh, for taking the time to do the talk and we really hope that we can meet in person uh, in the near future. And uh, thanks everyone for participating.